Hello. Hey, you're back. You're back. How are you feeling? Are you feeling any better? I remember last time you were here, you were complaining about uh, feeling a little irritable and being grumpy and a little short tempered, a little stir crazy. Yeah. Has any of that, any of that changed? Has any of that gotten better? Uh, let's see. What did we, what did we prescribe for you? We said that you should see your friends, right? Bug your friends said that you should have some alone time, you know, some time to yourself. We said you should probably schedule in some worship, some prayer time, and then to hang out in nature, hang out in God's creation. Were you able to schedule any of that? Were you able to do any of that? Cause I think when, I think when I'm talking to other patients and they're describing to me what they're feeling, I think they're talking about being bored, right? We're, I think we're all a little bored right now. Uh, we're doing stuff. Sure. We're staying active. Yes. But it's just the same routine. One day just bleeds right into the next and we're doing the same thing every day, right? I'm bored. My, my kids say that all the time. They want to be entertained. Well, they want me to entertain them. But I mean, let's talk, right? Let's talk. I think boredom comes from this sense of not having an awareness of your purpose, right? I, I think that boredom comes from this overall sense of discontentment and dissatisfaction with your life. I was going to Walmart uh, one time. I saw this guy, he's wearing a shirt and his shirt said, I got up for this, right? And I think that accurately describes this sense of dissatisfaction that we're probably all feeling right now, because without purpose, we begin to question everything that we do. Nothing has any meaning and nothing satisfies. And we begin to ask ourselves that question. Why did I get out of bed this morning? I got up for this. Boredom comes from a lack of purpose. And when people uh, in our world get bored, then they start to live without purpose. You know, another place people get bored a lot, church, right? It's, it's nice to hear all of you saying that you want to get back to church. But when I was a kid, church was boring. And when I was a teenager, I didn't like going to church. I, in fact, I couldn't wait for church to be over. And again, I think the reason we're bored is for the same reason. And, and not so much that we don't understand uh, the purpose, like, why am I here? Uh, and, and, and certainly that comes into play, right? We got old music, bad coffee, and I got to wear dress shoes, right? I, I got out of bed for this. But maybe another reason we're bored in church is not so much that we don't know our purpose for being there, but I think we can also forget the much larger purpose of church. Jesus says in Matthew five, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. Jesus says, you are to be the spice of life. Don't forget that. Jesus tells the church, don't forget your purpose. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That's not boring. That's a mission statement. That's a, that's a church with purpose. It, it, if you live that way, if your church exists for those reasons, there's no, there's no excuse to be bored. I know all of the days feel the same. I know the schedule is totally gone. Even those of us who are still going to work, we can still feel it. But we got to do something to keep that spark. 
We got to do something to keep that feeling, to keep going, to receive encouragement and to continue to find purpose as the church. So last week I had four prescriptions for you, right? Four prescriptions uh, and they're, they're all from Jesus's life, Jesus's habits, things that he did, his schedule. And so I thought today we'll, we will share four more, okay? What did Jesus do when he needed replenishment? What did he do when he needed structure? What did he do when he needed to be re-energized? So I have four more of Jesus's prescriptions for a healthy life. The first one is Jesus fed his mind on scripture. Jesus fed his mind on scripture. And you know, Jesus had a habit. He had a habit of using passages from the Bible to defend his actions and to establish his ministry. And last week we mentioned Jesus got away by himself to pray sometimes, most memorably uh, the time he spent 40 days in the desert. Well, it was while he spent those days alone in the desert, 40 days in isolation, 40 days in lockdown, that he became aware of all the temptations that were around him. Oscar Wilde said, I can resist anything except temptation. But he also said, the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. One 1800s American writer said one half the trouble of this life can be traced to saying yes too quickly and not saying no soon enough. In the temptation story found in Matthew 4, the Bible says the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So here we see Jesus being tempted by power, riches, and control. These are all the things that every human being would want. Every human who has sought these things out have started wars for these things, died for these things. Jesus turns around and he quotes the scriptures back at temptation, most notably Deuteronomy 6.13. In fact, every single time Jesus is tempted in isolation, he responds back with the verses from the Bible. And that really should tell us something. And this is the reason why most of us have difficulty with the Christian life. And it's because we are very ignorant of God's word. We are unaware of all the promises that are in this book that are ours to inherit. Uh, all of the answers to life's problems can be found in this book, and which means we need to read it. We need to be good stewards of it. We need to keep it. We need to quote it, especially when we need it. You know, before lockdown, we, we all said we were too busy, right? I'm too busy to read the Bible. I don't have the time to read the Bible. Okay, what's our excuse now? In the Gospel of Luke, there's a wonderful story. Jesus is being hosted by sisters, uh, Martha and Mary. And in Luke 10, it says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up and said to him, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus comes to their home. And Mary is content to be still, to be silent, to be with the Lord. And Martha can't do that, right? She has to be busy. And she complains to Jesus that her sister isn't helping with the work. In how Luke tells the story, Martha becomes distracted and upset at many things. And so it is with us, right? Jesus is in the midst of our life. He has given us now 
a very slow moment in our life and we still become distracted and upset at the many things. Our world is so busy. Our lives are so full, even in quarantine. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just slow down for a little bit and be still and simply experience the presence of God in our life? Wouldn't it be nice if, if in the midst of our work and our family pressures and, and what's going on with our job, if, if we could just turn off Netflix, if we could just put the smartphones down and open our Bibles up. As part of his weekly routine, Jesus fed his mind on scripture and we should too. Number two, Jesus took long walks. Yep, Jesus took long walks. John 7, 10 says, after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then Jesus also went up, not publicly, but in private. Now, we read that and we don't think anything of it. We read that and we just go on to the next verse. But that's Jesus walking about 90 miles in private, the Bible says. That's 90 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem, which is anywhere from three to five days travel, depending on the route you take and how often you stop. John 10 says, again, the religious leaders in Jerusalem sought to arrest Jesus, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained and many came to him. Those words, he went away again, is Jesus walking about five miles. It might take you 20 minutes to walk a mile. So Jesus taking a five mile walk is an hour and 40 minutes, right? An hour and 40 minute walk, which I would guess would be pretty normal in a day to day life for people who live back then. I think an hour and 40 minute walk is probably nothing to people who live back then. What could you do? What could you get done if you had time to take an hour and 40 minute walk by yourself? I mean, we talked about having uh, time to pray, right? Could you pray on an hour and 40 minute walk? Absolutely. We talked about the need to get away by yourself. You're by yourself on an hour and 40 minute walk. I mean, we do a lot of things to relax and unwind. Uh, you know, you load up your car with all your uh, gym equipment and then you still have to get through traffic and get to the gym and settle into your goat yoga appointment. And then uh, you finish that, load the car back up and go home. That could take an hour and 40 minutes. Jesus just goes outside and walks. If you took an hour and 40 minute walk, just think you're taking a long walk. You have time to pray, time to worship, time to be alone. You're doing four things on Jesus's list right there. Number three, you might not like number three. I'm just warning you. <laughs> Jesus welcomed little children. As part of his routine, Jesus welcomed little children. And I think those of us who are trapped at home right now, uh, with the kids, we're, we're done with them. Like, you know, I can't wait till they can go to grandma's house. I can't wait till vacation Bible school comes back. And we probably feel horrible for saying that, you know, we, 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 we feel horrible for feeling that, but I don't, don't, don't. Okay. Cause we, we all feel a little punchy right now and we're all, we're all a little bit on edge, but in ancient Greece, in Rome, children, they weren't even considered real people. Back then, the entire social world was organized into inside and outside circles. With the center circle, it would contain the highest and most valued people. This would be people who were the ruling class, who were free, who probably were adult males. And then the outside circle was foreigners, and slaves and women 
and children. If you were a well-to-do parent, you probably didn't even interact with your children. You left all that up to the care of their teachers and, their sla and your slaves. Children were very rudely brought up and, and to beat your children was normal. In fact, uh, in Rome, a child's father had every right to kill him for any reason until they were of age. So perhaps what's not surprising is this is how orphanages even came to be. It was because Christians uh, rebelled against some of the things that were being done to children, one of which was Exposito, which was uh, Roman parents could just abandon their kids to the streets. And so Christians founded orphanages so that children could be taken care of. And they learned that because of what they saw from Jesus and how he lived his life. Jesus stood against many things that were socially and normal, things that were acceptable. In Matthew 19, it says, children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Jesus has a habit of welcoming children into his presence. This habit reflects the priority God places on these little ones who are in our lives. I know my wife and I, we got into the habit of letting the kids do what they want. I mean, more and more lately, and to the point that we're now ignoring them just so that we can get our own work done. But in these last weeks, we have felt this passion to rekindle being attentive parents and, and to remember that they are people too, that they have feelings, that they have needs, and that God places those children in our lives so that we can teach them and encourage them and help them grow. Last one. Last week I said that Jesus hung out in God's creation. But another habit that we see Jesus do is that Jesus hangs out in the real world. Now, what do I, what do I mean by that? Well, you can use whatever word you want to use, okay? He hung out with pagans. He hung out in the secular world. He partied with the non-religious and with the sinner. Listen to Jesus describe himself in his own words. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, the son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Here we see Jesus daring to be seen, associating with sinners. And he gets called out for it by all of the religious peers. And the great thing about this is he doesn't care. In fact, he's okay with it. Why? Because it gives him another opportunity to teach people about the love of God and to display the love of God to anyone he could relate to. It's easy to say that God loves everybody. Okay. But it's another thing to actually hang out with those people and invite them into your life. Even people that you're not comfortable with simply because yes, God loves them. Why do you think all of these sinful people, why do you think they were attracted to Jesus anyway? I mean, he was a rabbi and I'll tell you a secret. Okay. Nobody is rushing to party with their pastor. Okay. No, no group of people get together and they're going to go on a bar crawl through the city and one guy shouts out, Oh, you know who we should call our pastor. But people wanted to hang out with Jesus simply because he was willing to be seen with them. He was willing to be their friends. There's this mindset among Christians that says that we should hide ourselves away from sinners. Some Christians have always believed in social distancing from non-Christians. 
because they didn't want to get infected by the world's sin. And I think that's certainly a possibility. You know, instead of being the influence, we can be open to temptation. That's possible. But what I think is important and what we need to grasp here is the fact that Jesus did all the influencing and he never allowed the outside world to influence him. Yes, we are called to be separate from the world. And of course, we should not allow the world to tear us away from our relationship with Jesus. But I think Jesus would insist that in doing that, we not so much pull away from the world, rather we are to impact it. We are to influence it, to teach it. Christians should be leading the change in the world. Christians should be the motivators and we should be the creative minds that people look to. So what about you? Could anyone say that of you? Could anyone who is not yet a believer point to you as someone who genuinely cares about their life? I hope so, because that's the purpose of the church. The church is the only organization on earth that exists for the benefit of those who do not attend. The global plan for healing the world is the church. So I don't see how anyone could be bored knowing that. There is a great need. We have a great responsibility. The church has a purpose and we need to be reminded of it again. In leaving boredom and finding our purpose again, we can change our attitudes from, I got out of bed for this, which is a question mark, which is a statement of being dissatisfied, a statement of discontent, to, I got out of bed for this, with an exclamation point. This is the reason I got up this morning, because nothing creates more satisfaction than finding your purpose. This is the reason that I live. This is the reason I do all the things that I do. When I turn to God, we, I find all the purpose I will ever need. We choose our attitude. And we can either look at every single day as you know, a checklist of all the things that I have to do in order to earn my weekend or earn my free time or earn my play or we can approach every single day with a sense of adventure and look for the things that God can do through us. How could God use your church to change the world? How could God use you to change the world? Ephesians 2 10 says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We should pray and look for opportunities to tell the world about Jesus. We should pray and look for opportunities to help others. We should pray and look for opportunities to encourage each other. We should know our purpose and that purpose will eliminate all the boredom of our lives and ultimately we'll draw closer to God. And that's a beautiful thing. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we could come together this morning, not only to learn more about your son and the things that were important to him, the daily practices that he kept to keep himself on task, to keep himself relaxed, to ease through his stress, but also the tactics and the techniques he used to influence and impact the world around him. Lord, may we never forget our purpose to do the same, to be the salt of the earth, to be a light on a hill, to continue to love and offer grace, to extend mercy to the world around us, to be the influencer, and ultimately to bring everyone to a closer understanding and relationship with you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for our friends in this church and for the week ahead of us. 
We pray that you go with us in every step. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Don't forget, we have a Monday devotional over on YouTube that'll go uh, live tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we have a full program of activities and games for kids on Zoom. And you can always get that information from Pastor Kevin. And then on Thursdays, we go live on Facebook at 1 p.m. And we're all looking forward to being together again. We're working on uh, making plans. We're calling all of you guys. And if you ever need us, of course, we're always here at the church. We're available by phone and email. Or you can always stop by to drop off your tithe. I love you guys. I'll see you soon.